Hello everyone and welcome to the second video of our MTAP for Clinical Parasitology. In this video, we will talk about the Phydum platyhelmets. So your platyhelmets is comprised of two classes. We have your class Cestoda, which are your tapeworms uh, and divided into two categories, the Pseudophilidaean and the Cyclophilidaeans. Your class Trematoda, also known as flukes, are classified into several types of organisms based on the organs that they invade. So these are your intestinal, liver, lung, and blood flukes. So all of these will be discussed in this part 2 lecture video. So let's start with the class Cestoda or the tapeworms. So let's compare your cestodes to trematodes. So your class uh, cestode or cestoda are ribbon-like, just like here on this picture. They are also segmented. So later on, we'll be discussing the uh, different types or the different parts of its um, segments. There are no circulatory system and digestive tract present in cestodes. And they are mostly hermaphroditic or what we call the monoecious parasite. So that means there is only one single parasite present in the host. So now let's talk about the morphology of our cestodes or tapeworms. So the first one is the scolex. So this is a segment that is anteriorly uh, uh, positioned and this is actually the attachment organ of the tapeworm. So there are two types of scolex based on the order that these parasites are classified into. So the first one is the botriate. So botriate is the spindle shape, spatulate or sometimes spoon shape with sucking groups. So this is only unique to the order Pseudophilidea, which comprise of your Diphilobotrium latum and Spirometra species. Next one is your Acetabulate. So this is the most common scolex, and this is only unique to your uh, Cyclophilideans. No? Especially um, examples of this is your Tenia solium and Tenia saginata. So your Acetabulate is quadrate, so that means uh, this may be uh, this may be shaped as a cube-like, and contains muscular suckers or what we call the acetabula. So some of these muscular suckers contains hook or spines or what we call the rostellum. So the next one is your neck. So the neck is the region of growth for the tapeworm. Next is the strobula. So these are chains of segments or what we call the proglottids. So your strobula, just like here on this picture, is comprised of the three main proglottids. So we have your immature, mature, and the gravid proglottid. So let's talk about each one of them. So the first one is the immature segment. So when we say immature, so these contains reproductive organs that are not fully developed. While your mature segment, on the other hand, contain at least one set of reproductive organs, such as your testes and ovary. And lastly, gravid segment, just like here on this picture. So your gravid segment from the word gravid, which means pregnant. So this is the segment that is filled with eggs. So there are two ways on how our tapeworms release their eggs. So the first one is the apolytic proglottid. So through the uh, process apolysis, so in order for these particular tapeworms to release their eggs, they should detach specifically the gravid proglottids. So, hence the name apolytic proglottid. So, these are unique to your cyclophilidaean. An example of this is your tenia species. Next one is anapolytic proglottid. So, this is the counterpart of your apolytic, which means that uh, in order for our tapeworms to release the egg, uh, sorry, uh, for ap anapolytic, they release the egg first and then the gravid or the proglottid is detached. Again, for anapolytic, the eggs should be released first, normally, just like any parasite, and then right after the proglottid is being detached. So this is unique to your pseudophilidaean. An example of this is your dilatum. So here is the difference between the two orders of our cestodes, the pseudophilidaean and the cyclophilidaean. So kindly take note, just like we have discussed a while ago, in terms of the ova, your pseudophilidaean, just like your dilatum, so these are immature when laid, and most of our eggs are operculated compared to your cyclophilidaean that are 
non-operculated, so that means they do not contain operculum. Later on, we'll discuss this. And they are matured when laid by the worm. Also, take note of the requirement in terms of their intermediate host. So, your pseudophilidean requires at least two intermediate hosts, while your cyclophilidean requires one uh, intermediate host. So, let's start with the order pseudophilidea. So, so, there are only two parasites that are under your pseudophilidea, and the first one is the Diphilibotrium latum, or in short, Dilatum. So, your Dilatum is the fish tapeworm and the broad tapeworm. So, this is the largest tapeworm of man, and the first intermediate host of these parasites are the copepods, which are usually uh, small microscopic animals that are present in the water. So, the second one is the freshwater fish. So, the definitive host of this parasite is humans. So, humans are infected with this parasite by the ingestion of the plerosorcoid. So, this is the infective stage of our parasite, also known as the sparganum, which is usually uh, present in the flesh or tissues of the freshwater fish. So, in terms of the morphology, kindly go over to page 20 to check for the table. So, for D. latum, the adult of this particular parasite, in terms of their scolex, are spatulate. No? So, maka silang spoon, just like here, or spatula. So, this spatulate contains no rostellium or hooks. So, there is absence of hooks or rostellium, but rather, they contain two sucking groups which are called botria. So, in terms of the strobula, these are broader than long, and the uterus contains central or are coiled in appearance. Sometimes, they call it as rosette. The egg of this parasite is operculated, just like here on this picture. So, it contains an operculum, which is a lid-like structure that opens once the larva is already matured. So, this particular egg are also similar to your Paragonimus westermanni. So it's very important that if the two are present in a sample, we have to check for the um, other morphological stages. So again, just like we have discussed, your dilatum, the infective stage of this parasite, is the perosarcoid or sparganum. So in terms of the pathology, this is also known as the diphilobotriasis, and it is associated with vitamin B12 deficiency or megaloblastic anemia. So there are also non-specific gastrointestinal problems such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, and so on. So in terms of diagnosis, direct microscopy is enough to diagnose this parasite. So sometimes these eggs confuse with paragonimus eggs. That's why it's very important to assess the adult worms instead. So, the next pseudophilidean is Spirometra species, specifically Spirometra mansoni. The old name of this parasite is Diphilebotrium mansoni, but right now, this is already considered under the genus Spirometra. So, just like your Diphilebotrium latum, it requires copepods as their first intermediate host. The second intermediate host is the frogs and snakes. And the definitive hosts are your cats and dogs. So these are uh, this spe uh, specific organism is a zoonotic parasite of dogs and cats. In humans, we are considered accidental hosts. So how do we acquire accidentally this parasite? So there are two types of mode of transmission. The first one is the ingestion of prosercoid. So, this is the first larval stage of your spirometra, which is present in the first intermediate host, your copepods. So, um, this particular mode of transmission is done or is caused by ingesting or drinking contaminated water with copepods. The next one is the ingestion of the plerosarcoid or sparganum. So, this is the most common one by eating infected frogs or snakes. So in terms of the morphology, your spirometra, specifically the sparganum or plerosarcoid, contains an anterior end that is thickened and wrinkled. Usually this anterior end also contains a cleft-like invagination just like here on this picture. 
So remember, since we are accidental hosts for this parasite, we do not harbor the egg and adult forms of this particular parasite, your Spirometra mansoni. So in terms of the disease, again, the infective stage of this parasite is the plerosarcoid or the sparganum. So this causes sparganosis. So this is an extra intestinal infection that is usually painless. So sometimes they can be dislodged in the brain, causing neuro deficits. So the only diagnosis for this parasite is through tissue biopsy. So we're done with the Pseudophilidaean, so let's go to the order Cyclophilidaea. So the first two species that we'll be discussing under Cyclophilidaea are your Tainia species. So the first one is Tainia saginata. So this is also known as the beef tapeworm, and this is acquired by ingestion of Cystocircus bovis. So this is the larval stage of the parasite, but also the infective stage. So this is acquired by ingestion of contaminated beef. So in terms of the host, so these are your cattle. So they act as the intermediate host and the man act as the definitive host. So we harbor the adult stage of the parasite. So in terms of the disease, this is called the teniasis. So teniasis is basically the presence of adult in the intestine causing intestinal obstruction due to their larger size. So for diagnosis, this is diagnosed by fecalysis, so direct microscopy lang. But be mindful that the eggs of this Tainia saginata may resemble pollen grains. So careful collection of stool is uh, recommended or followed. So for Tainia solium, Tainia solium is the pork tapeworm. And there are actually two types of uh, transmission for this particular parasite. So the first one is the ingestion of Cystocircus cellulosae. So this is the infective stage of our parasite and this is usually acquired by ingesting uh, infected pork. Sometimes they call this as the misli pork or the double dead pork. So next one is the ingestion of eggs. So this is accidentally ingestion of egg through fecal oral route and this causes cystocircosis. So in terms of the host, both the man, I uh, sorry, both man can be the intermediate host and the definitive host. So, but the uh, common or the natural intermediate host of this parasite are swine, specifically pigs. So there are two types of diseases that uh, this particular parasite may cause. So the first one is teniasis. So just like your tenia saginata, due to the adult stage, they can cause intestinal obstruction in our intestines. Next one is cystocircosis. So this is the presence of the larval stage of the parasite. So it may cause uh, eosinophilia, fever, and several signs and symptoms regarding this particular parasite. So again, auto-infection is also uh, possible to this uh, parasite since we are considered as an intermediate host. So for the diagnosis, fecalysis can also be used, specifically direct microscopy. So just like your saginata, eggs of tenia solium can also be misdiagnosed as pollen grains. So for cystocircosis, tissue biopsy and x-ray can be used. So the most important one here to differentiate the two is through the uh, viewing of their adult stage. So kindly go over again to page 20 for the morphology of our cestodes. So let's talk about the difference between the, uh, the two Tainia species, your Tainia saginata, and Tainia solium. So remember, for Cyclophilidaeans, all of these particular parasites contains suckers or acetabulum, specifically for suckers. So they, are, they only differ in terms of the presence of hooks. So for saginata, there is no rostellum or hooks in their scolex. While for Tainia solium, there is a double crown with 25 to 30 hooks in their scolex. So let me show you. So as you can see, these collects just here on this picture for Tainia solium contains multiple hooks. While for Saginata, wala. Okay, mali na siyang tignan. So the absence of hooks in their scolex is for Tainia saginata. 
Next one, in terms of the proglutid, these are longer than broad. So, both tenia sejenata and tenia solium. For the genital pore, for tenia sejenata, it has a irregular alternation and it contains 15 to 30 lateral branches on their uterus. So, sometimes for tenia sejenata, their, these types of branches are described as dichotomous or trilite. So, let me show you later on. So, for tenia solium, in terms of their genital pore, these are regular alternation with 7 to 12 lateral branches on their uterus. So, others say that the lateral branches of tenia solium may resemble fingers or are called dendritic. So, let me show you. So, here is the tenia sejenata. So, as you can see, it has multiple um, lateral branches no? around 15 to 30 and these are tree like in appearance while your tenia solium these have lesser lateral branches at around 7 to 12 and these particular branches are shaped or appeared as fingers in terms of their eggs these uh, both of these eggs of your tenia sejenata and tenia solium are non-operculated so unlike your dilatum that are operculated for eggs of your tenia species these are operculated and usually are hexicant in nature so when we say hexicant the outer layer of the egg just like here on this picture are usually or usually contains hooks so these are all hooks surrounding your egg okay hexicant embryo so let's talk about the Hymenolepis species. So in terms of these species, there are two clinically significant. So the first one is the H. nana or Hymenolepis nana. So this is the dwarf tapeworm and this is the smallest tapeworm of men. So in terms of the mode of transmission, this is through ingestion of cystocercoid larva. So this is the infective stage of your Hymenolepis nana. So this is acquired by accidentally ingesting arthropod, infected arthropod, or direct ingestion of eggs through fecal oral route. In terms of their host, man can be intermediate host and also your arthropods, such as your grain beetles. So for the definitive host, the only definitive host of your H. nana is human. So human can be uh, both your intermediate host and definitive host for H. nana. So this is the only tapeworm that can complete its entire life cycle in a single host. In terms of the disease, the disease is self-limited, so asymptomatic to. So there are no signs and symptoms felt by the patient. And usually, this goes uh, or this is self-limited, so the disease, uh, if you're infected with the parasite, goes along after a while unless you are infected again through fecal oral route. For the diagnosis, both your age nana and diminuta, they can be described by direct microscopy. For age diminuta, this is also known as the rat tapeworm, so both your age nana and diminuta their infective stages is the cystocercoid larva. Again, both of these can be acquired by accidentally ingesting infected arthropod. For H. nana, the arthropod is the rat flea, which also acts as the intermediate host of this parasite. The definitive host of this parasite is rat. So, the uh, humans can be accidental So by ingesting this arthropod. So, for... The disease, just like your H. nana, your H. diminuta, is asymptomatic as well. But remember, in terms of auto-infection, H. nana is possible. So, since we are the intermediate host of this parasite, while for H. diminuta, auto-infection is not possible because we are not the intermediate host, but rather the rat flea. So now let's differentiate the morphology of the two Hymenolepis species. So the first one is H. nana. So remember, in terms of their scolex, H. nana contains an arm brostellium with 20 to 30 hooks. While for diminuta, it contains an, an arm brostellium which usually is devoid of hooks or without hooks. So here is the picture. So as you can see, there is no or the absence of hooks for H. diminuta in their scolex, while for H. nana, there is the presence of an arm brostellium with 20 to 30 hooks, just like here on this picture. 
Next one, in terms of their proglutid, these are broader than long. In terms of their unit, uh, genital pore and uterus, for genital pore, uh, pore there is a lateral uh, alteration or uh, alternations of their genitals. For uterus, there is a succulate present. So, just like here on this uh, picture. So, their uterus is succulate shape, just like a cactus. Well, for the eggs, kindly take note for each nana, it contains two polar thickenings with four to eight filaments. So, for each diminuta, there are no filaments present. So, let me show you. So, for each nana, as you can see, the filaments are very visible at the terminal end of the parasite. While for diminuta, there are no presence of filaments, only the two polar thickenings. So the other species under Cyclophilidea, so these are considered zoonotic parasites. So they attack or they require animals as their definitive host. So the first one is Dipelidium caninum. This is the dog tapeworm and the double pored tapeworm. So later on, we'll explain why it is so-called the double pored tapeworm. So the mode of transmission of this parasite is through ingestion of cysticercoid larva. So this is the infective stage of the parasite through infected arthropod. So usually, the infected arthropods are under the uh, genus of this uh, particular uh, flea. So we have the dog flea, the cat flea, and the human flea. So they act as the intermediate host of the parasite. Of course, the definitive host is uh, usually is dogs or cats. So usually, in terms of the life cycle, humans act as an accidental host by accidentally inf uh, ingesting the arthropod. So again, your infective stage for decaninum is cystocercoid larva, and the disease is usually asymptomatic, just like your Hymenolepis species. So for the diagnosis, we can check for the presence of gravid proglutids, okay, which resembles melon seeds, pumpkin seeds, cucumber seed, or rice grains under the microscope, just like here on this picture. Next one is Echinococcus granulosus or E. granulosus. So this is the hydatid tapeworm and it is an extra-intestinal tapeworm because it attacks the liver, lungs, and central nervous system, specifically the tissues of these particular organs. So this is the shortest tapeworm of man and it only contains three segments, just like the other uh, cyclophilideans. So, the mode of transmission of this particular parasite is through ingestion of eggs. So, the, uh, the intermediate host of this parasite is sheep and the definitive host is canine, just like the wolf, no? With it, which is usually the predator of sheep. So, humans are also considered accidentally uh, host or accidental host by ingestion of eggs. So, in terms of the infective stage, so the infective stage of this parasite is the hydatid cyst. So, your hydatid cyst is a cyst containing a fluid with broad capsules and protoscoliosis, just like here on this picture. So, your brood capsules are formed within the cyst and usually contains 30 to 40 protoscoliosis. So, each of these is capable of developing into a single tapeworm. And usually, uh, symptoms depend on the location of the cyst. So, sometimes they can, uh, it can result to pressure necrosis and leakage or rupture of this particular cyst. So, in terms of diagnosis, there are two types. So, the first or the most common one is the tissue biopsy, where we can view the hydatid cyst in an infected tissue. We can also use x-ray to check the presence of the cyst uh, in, in the organ of the patient or tissues of the patient. Another diagnosis is uh, through immunological testing by the use of bentonite flocculation test. So again, just like we have discussed this in your nematodes, this is the usage of serum to check for the antibodies of the particular pairs, uh, to check for the antibodies against the parasite. Uh, in terms of the skin test, 
This is called the Cassoni intradermal test. So just like the Bachmann intradermal test of Trichinella spiralis, your Echinococcus granulosus, the Cassoni intradermal, intradermal test. So this is injecting a dilution of your uh, Echinococcus granulosus antigen. So if the patient contains antibodies against the antigen or specifically the parasite, a large wheel of at least 2 to 4 cm is uh, created. Okay, surrounded by a zone of erythema. So that means the patient contains antibodies. So let's differentiate the two zoonotic parasites under the Cyclophilidae. So the first one is the Decaninum. So in terms of their morphology, specifically on their scolex, your Decaninum is conical in shape with a rostellum that is refractile containing 1 to 7 circlets of hooks. So later on, we'll show, we will be showing you the picture of these types of hooks. So pag sinabi natin circlets, so mas maliit. No? These are miniature hooks present on their scolex for decaninum. Well, for E. granulosus, so their scolex is globular with a rostellum of double crown, 30 to 36 hooks. So let me show you a picture. So here is the decaninum. So as you can see, the scolex is filled with 1 to 7 circlets, so miniature hooks on their scolex. While for E. granulosus, the presence of 30 to 36 hooks, which acts or which resembles a double crown. While for the proglutid, so in terms, for, in terms of decaninum, the proglutid is shaped as a V or vase or a barrel. So just like what I have showed you a while ago, this uh, proglutid, specifically the gravid proglutid, contains the egg of our parasite. So these eggs may resemble cucumber seed or pumpkin seed when viewed under the microscope. While for E. granulosus, the proglutid is longer than broad. In terms of their genital pore, so as you can see here, the genital pore for decaninum is double. So we have two genital pore on their proglutids, hence the name doubled pore tapeworm. While for E. granulosus, these are lateral in alterations. In terms of the um, uterus for decaninum, it contains a reticular. So this is shaped as a reticular shape with egg capsules, just like here on this picture. Well, for Echinococcus granulosus, it contains 12 to 15 lateral branches. So, parang kamukha siya ni Tenya sa Genata, no? So, for the decaninum egg, so these are egg capsules, no? Ganito yung itsura nila when viewed under the microscope. Well, for E. granulosus, these are similar to Tenya species, no? So, these are hexacant. So that ends the lecture discussion for class cestod or cestoda under the phylum platyhelminths. So move over to part 3 for the class trematoda or the flux. Thank you.